Jacob Zuma's MK party won a massive 58 seats in parliament in the May elections, parachuting them ahead of the economic freedom fighters as the country's third largest political party. And because the two bigger parties, the ANC and the DA, are in a government of national unity together, the MK party is now the official opposition. So what is their strategy going to be like in parliament? I'm Rebecca Davis, senior journalist for Daily Maverick. Now, it's been really difficult to try to get a sense of what the MK party's parliamentary caucus is going to look like because they keep changing it. Before elections, every political party has to submit a list of the MPs they're going to send to parliament. And the list that the MK party submitted in advance has basically been torn up because there's been so much internal upheaval in the party generally. Don't forget that this is a party where it's been confirmed that Jacob Zuma makes all the hiring and firing decisions, which is really unprecedented in South Africa's democratic politics. The EFF has been accused of being a dictatorship, but even the EFF has elective conferences where leaders are voted for by party members. The NK party has said they're not going to hold electoral conferences, and the ostensible reason they give is that it's so people can't buy position. But the real reason seems to be simply that it's Zuma who calls the shots. And Zuma seems to be changing his mind a lot. So for instance, we had Arthur Zwane appointed Secretary General of the party for two weeks before Zuma fired him. One week later, he was reappointed, but barely three weeks later, fired again. Then there's Siklen Gubane, removed as the party's Secretary General, replaced by Zwane, given the role of MK party chief whip in parliament instead, until last week, the party announced that it was replacing Ngubane as chief whip with Umtuanele Mani. In August, it suddenly emerged that the party had fired 18 of its MPs, prompting 10 of them to go to court asking for reinstatement, arguing that some of them had quit their jobs and relocated to Cape Town with their families to take up the MP roles they had been promised. That court matter is still pending. Those MPs were fired, however, to make room for some big names. In particular, Three men in charge of South Africa's state-owned enterprises during the Zuma era who have been accused of running them into the ground through alleged corruption and other forms of mismanagement. Former ESCOM CEO Brian Molefe, former Prasa CEO Lucky Montana, and former Transnet CEO Sia Bonga Gama. Now, these aren't just friends of Zuma who need a job. Their selection as MK Party MPs is really a window into what the MK Party is aiming to do in Parliament as its wider political strategy, and that is to rewrite the story of the Zuma presidency. When the MK party announced Molefe, Montana and Gama as MPs, it said that they were the perfect example of talented black professionals sidelined by the Ramaphosa administration. This is a wild reading if you consider the condition in which these men left their respective state-owned entities. But this is gonna be the MK party narrative, and it's similar to the one that the Trump campaign is currently using in the States. That's to persuade the country that things were better under the previous president, even though the facts do not support that. Let me give you an example of what this is gonna look like in terms of MK's parliamentary strategy. One of the most important committees in parliament is the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, SCOPA. It's responsible for scrutinizing the balance books of all public entities. And at the first meeting of that committee two weeks ago, MK MP David Skosana suggested that one of their first orders of business should be to focus on Transnet in order to understand why its performance has been so much weaker under the Ramaphosa administration than in the Zuma administration. That is not true, by the way. In fact, Transnet is headed to make a profit this year for the first time in ages. But the facts seem not to matter. MK is clearly going to be using its parliamentary platform at every opportunity to hammer home the idea that the Zuma presidency was better for South Africa than the Ramaphosa administration. Here's another example. Lawlessness and poverty have become a defining feature of the ANC of Mr. Ramaphosa. The MK party has observed a sharp increase in extortion cases. This is a troubling indicator of the country economic struggle. Compared to the glorious years of uh, His Excellency President Zuma, the current surge in extortion incident co coincide with a significant rise in unemployment. It's not subtle stuff, but this is how you rewrite history. And because the MK party is now the official opposition in parliament, they get assigned more time than the other parties to make speeches and statements. We still don't know the full composition of the MK caucus or who is sitting on what committee, 
And this level of chaos must be presenting headaches behind the scenes for Parliament as well. But as we at Daily Maverick have argued from the start, chaos is the point for the MK party. Anything which serves to hinder the functioning of our democratic institutions is probably a net win for a party which wants to tear up the constitution and which has said it would completely reorganize Parliament filling half of parliament with unelected traditional leaders. So from what we've witnessed so far, the MK party may be in organizational disarray, but it does seem to have a clear ideological blueprint for how they're going to put their stamp on parliament. It likely will not be through the kinds of shenanigans that the EFF, for instance, has previously brought to the house, but through this relentless messaging about the imaginary superior South Africa that Zuma was president of. And the end game? It can only be for Zuma, or at least his closest proxies, to take power once again.